Amid the bustling Starship launches at the Starbase site, the Florida site has not been idle either. Recently, the FAA Launch Licensing Agency announced a document stating the environmental impact of Starship on Pad LC-39A in Florida. This is a huge opportunity for SpaceX as Florida is about to potentially welcome dozens of new Starship launches. And this is even more astounding than what we could have imagined. Let's find out more in today's episode of Alpha Tech. The 12-page Environmental Impact Statement EIS of SpaceX under the supervision of the FAA regarding Starship launches from LC-39A at Kennedy has just been published. This report summarizes everything SpaceX's Starship can accomplish and the environmental impacts that these launches may cause. When you read the article, you can immediately envision what SpaceX will do with a Starship system in Florida. Now, we'll summarize and analyze the noteworthy new items in this latest document. The details revealed in the FAA's Environmental Impact Statement for Starship launches from LC-39A at Kennedy Space Center highlight SpaceX's ambitious plans and the significant infrastructure required to support a high cadence of Starship Super Heavy launches. The vehicle design with 35 inches on the Super Heavy booster and 9 on Starship itself underscores the massive thrust and propellant needs. Oh, we have foreseen the future of a new Starship variant in Florida. The nine Raptor engines on Starship are understandable since it has been announced, but 35 Raptors is a number we just heard for the first time. It's not yet known where the two additional engines will be added in the current Super Heavy configuration, but this is certainly going to be interesting. The maximum liftoff thrust of the launch vehicle is predicted to be 103 meganewtons MN. Starship will have a maximum liftoff thrust of about 28 MN. Super Heavy is expected to contain up to 4,100 tons of propellant and Starship up to 2,600 tons of propellant. The expected launch cadence of up to 44 launches per year with landings permitted both at the pad and on drone ships showcases SpaceX's vision for rapid reusability and high flight rates. However, in reality, we have never heard of Starship potentially landing on a drone ship because Super Heavy has already eliminated the landing leg design. I think this might be a backup method that's unlikely to happen, and if it does, the drone ship would have to be much larger and more massive than the current one we see for Falcon 9 landings. Additionally, 44 launches per year just for Florida at the current time might be a large number. But if everything develops in the future, is that enough for Elon's space ambitions, or are we just seeing the beginning? Well, what do you think about this? Comment with the number you think best matches SpaceX capabilities. By the way, if you enjoyed our content, please make sure you like and subscribe to our channel. Next is the separate catch tower for Starship, distinct from the integration tower for Super Heavy, which suggests a streamlined architecture to mitigate risks during catching and refurbishing operations. The planned natural gas pretreatment and liquefaction system, along with an air separation plant, will enable on-site production of propellants, reducing transportation logistics. Speaking of this, many people wonder why there is a separate catching tower for Starship. That question is understandable. In this way, SpaceX will never achieve an immediate turnaround speed because each time they have to move the vehicle from the catching tower to the launch tower, which takes time. However, there's been a detailed and reasonable explanation from Jack Gold, a YouTuber who specializes in analyzing SpaceX and whom I really like. Please make sure you support him. He pointed out that the upper stage of Starship does not always return to the launch site immediately after deploying its payload into orbit. Indeed, in some cases it can stay in space for extended periods, we're talking days, weeks, even months, before re-entering Earth's atmosphere and landing. For example, tanker variants of Starship could offload their propellant into orbital depots and then return to the launch pad, where they would be refueled and launched again on the same Super Heavy booster. In the case of Starlink missions, after landing, the Starship upper stages will need to be transported back to the payload integration facility to prepare for their next flight. Meanwhile, the Super Heavy booster may remain at the launch pad waiting for another Starship to be stacked on top for the next mission. Given these scenarios, it makes sense for SpaceX to have a secondary landing zone available at the launch site. Theoretically, a Starship upper stage could return for landing just hours before the Starship is scheduled for launch on the same pad. Of course, this flexibility is not something we expect to see at SpaceX's Starbase facility in Texas, where operational constraints may limit such rapid turnaround between launches and landings. Alongside the addition of the tower, notably the Deluge system's water usage of up to a million gallons per launch is two and a half times larger than its Starbase. Hopefully, the water deluge system will help absorb acoustic shock to mitigate the loss of heat shield tiles. Overall, all the details provided in the Environmental Impact Statement EIS for Starship launches from LC-39A 
paint a picture of SpaceX's ambition to create a fully self-sufficient Starship launch and landing facility at LC-39A, capable of supporting unprecedented launch cadence and turnaround times, supported by extensive ground infrastructure suitable for the world's largest launch operations. Following the EIS are two public meetings at Cape Canaveral and at Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex, known as the Scoping Phase, the public can submit concerns either in person or electronically through June 24th before the EIS goes into the next stages. It's important to remember that completing the EIS does not guarantee a launch license. However, our confidence in SpaceX is unwavering. We believe that the FAA will issue a launch license for Starship as planned just as they progress with Starship launches at Starbase. Reflecting on previous Starship missions, the FAA initially set significant obstacles for SpaceX, but their procedures have become more reasonable and swift since Flight 2, partly because SpaceX has minimized the impact of their flights and partly due to the urgency of Starship's future missions. Therefore, with Starship Flight 5, we can expect positive and swift outcomes. Previously, we had FAA approval documents for Flight 4. This revision will significantly affect future protocols, allowing SpaceX to proceed without risk assessment in certain situations, such as thermal protection system failures, control surface issues, or engine failures during landing, as long as they meet the safety requirements and criteria. In Flight 4, Starship encountered several major difficulties, including engine malfunctions, heat shield attachment, and flap damage. Although the engine failure did not affect subsequent flight stages, repairs and improvements will be necessary to optimize performance. Heat shield issues remain a challenge, with many tiles detaching and others cracking and partially melting due to their extreme temperatures. However, the heat shield protected Starship during re-entry, a remarkable achievement, and Elon Musk has assured immediate improvements will be made. The flap garnered the most attention, having been scorched and severely compromised during re-entry, causing Starship to touch down six kilometers away from the designated location. Nonetheless, Musk asserted this landing site was within the planned exclusion zone and did not endanger humans. He also stated it was a controlled landing thanks to the flap and engines, and they impressively remained attached until the journey's conclusion. Musk plans to adjust the flap's position for future flights. With the FAA's pre-approved scenarios, these issues are anticipated to undergo review rather than thorough investigation, greatly abbreviating the post-flight process. This paves the way for Flight 5, and even if the FAA probes, it should not affect the near-future timeline as SpaceX can conduct flights while investigations are ongoing, provided they meet safety standards. The FAA is also considering issuing a portfolio launch license for Starship, allowing multiple launches under a single license, similar to Falcon 9, creating an unprecedented launch frequency. With Starship, once its launch intensity increases, the aerospace industry will experience significant development, even if it only ascends to low Earth orbit. Over the years, the biggest hurdle to space exploration and the commercialization of space travel has been the inability of launch vehicles to carry heavy payloads. This requires carrying lots of fuel, hence a bigger rocket, and, and is a very expensive endeavor. Starship's capability to carry heavy payloads while being extremely cost-effective promises to change that. For instance, scientists will be able to launch much larger space telescopes, which could be built out of cheaper but heavier materials. They'll also be able to send bigger equipment in future Moon and Mars missions, such as a full-size drilling rig, which can drill up to a kilometer. This will give scientists unprecedented access to the interior of both the Moon and Mars, where useful resources are believed to be present. The Apollo missions, in contrast, were able to carry only small equipment to the Moon. Speaking to the journal Science, Philip Metzger, a physicist and space technologist at the University of Central Florida, said, If the mass and the volume of the payload are larger, then we can imagine other capabilities in space that has never been done. Thanks for watching today's episode. We appreciate you checking it out and hope to see you next time. Bye.